Well, uh, happy uh, Wednesday evening. Let's make sure I got some audio going. Yes, I do. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Gary. My ham radio call sign is W4EEY, Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee. And I'm uh, com coming to you from uh, Pendleton, South Carolina, which is uh, where my home is at the moment. And this is a ham radio class. Amateur radio, is it still a thing? Yeah, it is. And we're happy to have you with us. Uh, and um, let me just push a button over there, okay. Um, what we do is we are going through the American Radio Relay League licensing manual for technician class. Uh, it's this book, I always like to show it so you can see what we're doing. Uh, and we're going chapter by chapter each week uh, and uh, highlighting the uh, test questions. Uh, you get your license by get, uh, passing a 35 question multiple choice test. We go over all of the questions in the question pool, they're all in the book as well, and uh, prepare you uh, so that by uh, November when the class ends, you'll, you're ready to find a local ham club or go online and take your amateur radio test, and, and away you go. You can get your ham radio call sign and begin to get on the air. Uh, and uh, find a local club if you haven't already in your area find a local ham radio club if you need help let me know uh, and um, i'll help you find one and uh, go ahead and attend one of their meetings even though you're not licensed yet uh, and and find out what they're into uh, maybe it's uh, something that you're interested in and uh, we can uh, you know go from there uh, and uh, it's, it's a great hobby with great people. Uh, hopefully you'll find it as rewarding as I have. So uh, tonight we're going to be doing chapter five. Uh, but before we do, let me just make sure I turn this audio on over here. I'm a one man band tonight. Um, and um, oh, it helps if I can get on the right switcher. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, tonight 13 people in our uh, Zoom classroom with us, and I always ask uh, if there's anyone uh, who has uh, any questions about anything that we've covered so far, go ahead and unmute and, and just go ahead. I see Becky unmuted, but uh, she doesn't want to say anything. No. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, well, then let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm going to mute you there so that, uh, okay, that worked. Good. Um, so let's get started with Chapter 5. Uh, boom. New equipment. Got to figure it out. Um, amateur radio equipment is the title of the chapter, and the first section is modulation. And modulation is the whole thing about adding information to a radio frequency carrier because the carrier itself doesn't do as much good. So you might remember we talked about RF being radio frequency signals of, of all types. Let me turn on my laser pointer here. So this is a frequency spectrum, this is amplitude, and this is frequency, and you can see all sorts of different signals on this display. You know, here's a clear segment uh, where there's, there's no signals. Um, so radio frequency, RF, is radio frequency signals of all types. And when we impose information on the radio frequency carrier, that's called modulation. It's adding information to the radio wave. And different types of modulation serve different purposes. And the most basic, and the one that got us all started, is just turning that carrier on and off uh, in a pattern that people at the other end can recognize. That's Morse code, uh, and it, by turning the radio frequency carrier on and off uh, using a Morse code key uh, or a paddle or some other method, you can send text using the Morse code. And uh, it's not required for ham radio anymore, it used to be, uh, but it's still very, very popular. So, on Radio we call Morse code continuous wave transmissions. It has to do with even before there were radio frequency transmitters using tubes, there were radio frequency transmitters using alternators, believe it or not. Uh, motor generators, uh, alternators powered by uh, big motors that uh, would uh, uh, 
emanate a, a lot of energy uh, out on, on a broad range of frequencies. Before that, there were spark gap transmitters that actually uh, sent Morse code using sparks, which is an even broader wave. But with the advent of vacuum tubes, uh, we were able to transmit on just one frequency in a continuous fashion, hence it's called continuous wave. And it always used to be said that uh, Morse code or CW transmissions, continuous wave, were, they went the farthest. So, so if you had a 10 watt transmitter, uh, you'd probably have luck uh, with Morse code where you might not have luck uh, with a single sideband voice or some other voice transmission. Um, there's a new mode out, and we'll talk about it tonight, that actually beats Morse code or CW uh, for power per watt. Uh, and we'll talk about it. Um, just keying the transmitter on and off, you think, well, I, I'm just on one frequency, so I'm not occupying any bandwidth. Well, not quite. When you turn the uh, carrier on and off, that actually generates uh, um, energy on either side of the frequency, and so there is bandwidth uh, involved with Morse code transmission. It's not very wide. And when we're talking about bandwidth, what we're talking about is if here is the, where the radio frequency carrier signal is, that, that one frequency, where the half power points are, in this case it says minus 3 dB, where the half power points are, that is considered the bandwidth of the signal. And for Morse code, it's about 150 hertz wide. Uh, it can vary from transmitter to transmitter, uh, and sending speed also can, can have uh, uh, an influence on uh, what the bandwidth of a Morse code signal is. But for test purposes, remember, 150 hertz is the bandwidth of a Morse code signal. So remember, I, I talked about those uh, alternator transmitter or trans, yeah, transmitters using um, alternators at a lower frequency, 50 kilohertz or, or thereabouts. Um, and somebody got the bright idea of trying to add modulation to that by varying the signal strength. And they said, let's try it with voice. And so the first AM transmissions, as far as I know, were done using that sort of a transmit, uh, transmitter. But um, amplitude modulation was the first voice transmission that was used. And so here we have two signals. This, this is an audio frequency. This is a, a sine wave and an audio frequency. And here, radio frequency carrier waves, see it up and down, up and down, close together, and its amplitude follows that of the audio signal up above. This is an amplitude modulated signal in the time domain. So here we have amplitude or voltage, and here we have time. This is called the modulation envelope, and it's the, the peak values of, of the RF carrier plus the peak values of the modulating signal gives you the AM envelope, uh, the modulating envelope. So this is in the time domain. So if you hooked up an oscilloscope, this is what you would see. Now if we look at the same amplitude modulated signal, but in something called the frequency domain, so here we have amplitude again on the vertical scale, but now instead of time, we're looking at frequency. You'll see that there's a radio frequency carrier, a very strong one, at the center, and there are two other signals that go along with it, this one and this one. This one is lower in frequency than the carrier, and this one is higher in frequency than the carrier. And all three of these signals are transmitted uh, to make up that uh, AM signal. Uh, we call these signals side bands. And so this is the lower side band because it's lower than the carrier frequency. This is the upper side band. And we'll have a few more looks at it here. For an AM signal used for communications purposes, not broadcast, uh, the bandwidth is typically 6 kilohertz. And you can still hear AM transmitters on the 80 meter band, for example. Uh, there are still hams who uh, have boat anchor transmitters, transmitters that have been around for a long time, and they love putting them on the air. So you can actually hear AM transmissions uh, with, um, in the frequency domain, that, that carrier frequency, a lower side band and an upper side band. And for AM, the, the bandwidth required is 6 kilohertz. 
6,000 hertz as opposed to CW, which was only 150 hertz. Here's another look at also the, the frequency domain here. Uh, and we want to point out here that here's that carrier frequency. And the upper sideband consists of a range of frequencies. These are the audio frequencies. So low frequency audio bass tones, mid uh, audio here for, for voice, and high frequency tones are up here. That's the upper sideband. Interestingly, it inverts on the lower sideband. So here are low bass tones closest to the carrier. Here are voice frequencies, about 1,000 hertz, and then the higher frequencies out here. So this is about 3,000 kilohertz wide. This is about 3,000 kilohertz wide. The total is 6 kilohertz for an AM signal. Well, they decided that hmm, it would be better, possibly, if we could engineer our radios so that they didn't have to transmit that carrier and both sidebands. And a lot of single sideband, which is what we're going to talk about here now, uh, experimentation was done um, early on with Collins Radio and with the U.S. Air Force, the Strategic Air Command. Uh, they needed to have radios that could go a very long distance in order to contact their strategic bombers. And single sideband offered a way to do that. And uh, so what we do with single sideband is, um, here's, here's our AM signal that we've seen already, the six kilohertz wide one. Well, what if we were able to get rid of that radio frequency carrier and get rid of one of the sidebands? We, and we just transmitted this. That contains actually all of the information that you need to get a voice signal through. You just need a, a special receiver at the far end uh, that can reconstitute the, the missing carrier. And so this is an upper sideband signal, and this is a, a lower sideband signal. And uh, it was found if you had a 100-watt transmitter, well, that 100 watts is being divided up among all three of these components, the carrier, the upper sideband and the lower sideband. If you have that same 100 watt transmitter and it can be involved in just transmitting just this portion, it can go farther. Uh, it, it works a lot more efficiently. So single sideband is the most common type of voice transmission on the high frequency bands used for weak signal work also on VHF and UHF. Single sideband, because it's derived from AM, is a type of amplitude modulation. And you might guess, uh, well, let me just point out something here. Um, so this is an AM signal. There is something, we'll talk about it here in a little bit, called double sideband suppressed carrier. Note the carrier is gone, but both sidebands still exist. And you can actually transmit the, uh, this, uh, Commercially, in, for VOA, back in the day, they used to send VOA programs to relay stations overseas using this method. And they would send an English language program on upper sideband, and let's say a French program on the lower sideband. Um, and generating a double sideband suppressed carrier signal is not difficult, and we'll talk about that. Um, or you can suppress one of the sidebands and either get the lower sideband only or the upper sideband only only single sideband and the bandwidth of a single sideband signal is only half of that of an AM signal 3 kilohertz so remember Morse code CW bandwidth of about 150 Hertz an AM signal bandwidth for communications purposes bandwidth of about 6 kilohertz a single sideband signal 3 kilohertz bandwidth so Gary, well, okay, that's all well and good, and I've got my uh, high-frequency ham radio transceiver. I just bought an ICOM IC7300 um, from Gigaparts or DX Engineering or one of the other ham radio stores, and I got it in front of me. How do I know how to use it? How do I know upper sideband or lower sideband? Well, if you bought a brand new radio like the 7300, it's smart enough that when you go to the band, it'll choose the proper sideband. But if, if you have an older radio, for example, um, 
The convention is this. Based on early design principles, below 9 megahertz, hams use lower sideband. Above 9 megahertz, we use upper sideband. Now, there is a one exception to this. That's the 60 meter band. But um, by and large, below 9 megahertz, use lower sideband. Above 9 megahertz, we use the upper sideband. So I mentioned that a single sideband signal is three kilohertz wide. And we need to know where that three kilohertz is in, in occupying the band. Uh, so here's a, a 15 meter band, uh, and we're looking at a three kilohertz wide upper sideband signal. Uh, and here is the, the general class subband in the 15 meter band. Uh, and so we um, have to know that um, that's the lower edge, 21275. So this signal is going to occupy a bandwidth of 21275 to 21278. That's because of the 3 kilohertz width, and the last digit there is thousands of uh, hertz. So uh, it'll go 21275 to 21278. Likewise, at the upper part of the band, we know that we have to be, this is the top end of the 15 meter band. We can't transmit legally out of band up here. So we know that we have to occupy a bandwidth of about three kilohertz. So the highest we can tune our radio and transmit is 21447, knowing that our three kilohertz bandwidth will be within the band. We'll talk more about this here in just a little bit. Probably the first radios that you're going to get, though, whoops, wrong button, that one, uh, as a technician, uh, is not going to be a high frequency radio. It's probably going to be one of the little Baofangs or uh, Yesu or ICOM handhelds. Uh, and those radios use not single sideband for voice, but they use frequency modulation. And frequency modulation is where the voice signal amplitude varies the carrier frequency. The amplitude of that signal remains the same. In fact, those little radios are full output power all the time. So if it's a, if it's a 5 watt radio, when you key up, it'll transmit 5 watts frequency modulation. One benefit is that it's very immune to noise, impulse noise, and it so sounds very clean. And here's a, a depiction of audio signal, amplitude modulation, and frequency modulation. Let's look a little closer and uh, see it a little better here on this. So this is the amplitude modulation that we saw before. You can see it's varying in strength over time. Down here, the strength, the amplitude, the vertical, stays the same. But the frequency of the radio frequency carrier is varying in accordance with the audio. So that's frequency modulation. And frequency modulation has bandwidth. And for communications use, just know that it's between 10 to 15 kilohertz. We don't cover it in this class. We do cover it in the general class. There's a, a formula, Carson's bandwidth rule, that you can actually calculate uh, the frequency bandwidth. But just know, typically for the little handhelds, between 10 and 15 kilohertz uh, is a good uh, indication of the occupied bandwidth uh, of a signal. And so by review, Morse code CW, 150 hertz. AM signals, that's the full width with the carrier, 6 kilohertz bandwidth. Single sideband, 3 kilohertz bandwidth. And FM, much wider than any of those, 15 kilohertz in bandwidth uh, is, is typical. Another thing with the, the FM radios, the handhelds, uh, the demodulator in the FM receiver of the radio uh, will <laughs> actually, if you've got two signals coming up uh, at the same time, and one of them is, is significantly stronger than the other, the FM receiver in the radio will capture the strongest signal only, and you won't hear the other signal. It's called the capture effect. So you know, here we have a, a, a sig signal here in red, and here we have a signal here in blue, and the, the receiver, because of FM capture effect of an FM demodulator, 
will actually only output the stronger of the two signals. Just something to know about. So let's take a look back in time. I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to ask, but back in my day uh, when I was uh, involved in some of the early computers, we had bulletin board systems with 300 baud modems that you'd hook up to your you know, landline telephone, and we thought we were doing great. And you could log into the bulletin board system and maybe download a weather report or look up some other information. It, it took a long time, but it was fun. You could use a terminal uh, or a terminal program on your, your home computer. Well, ham radio operators wanted to get in on the fun, and they came up with the radio version of bulletin board systems, and it was packet radio. And with packet radio, again, you have a computer or a dumb terminal. Can't find dumb terminals anymore very much. You have, instead of a modem, you have something called a terminal node controller. And the terminal node controller will um, actually send audio to an FM radio. One of those little handhelds would work. Uh, and would receive audio from the FM radio, and would also energize the push-to-talk line. Uh, and so that little FM radio would transmit out and connect up to your friend's packet radio station that might either be running a bulletin board system on the, the packet uh, TNC there, or you could uh, type keyboard to keyboard. So back in the day when there was the phone line bulletin board systems, hams were doing packet radio. And the packet refers to the, the data structure uh, of um, the uh, packet of information. It's got uh, start bits and a preamble and some information about it, uh, and then the data, the, the payload uh, that's inside of it. But remember that packet radio uses FM or even phase modulation. We'll talk about that next. FM and phase modulation are kissing cousins. A type of frequency modulation is phase modulation. Uh, and so up above here we have the, the audio signal. It's kind of a ramp at the moment. But, um, and here we don't see, we see the frequency changing, but we also see some other little glitches in here. That's the phase of the signal is being altered as well. And the difference between FM and phase modulation is that with FM, just the amplitude of the audio signal changes the frequency, whereas in phase modulation, the amplitude and the frequency of the modulating signal can affect the amount of frequency deviation. So um, low bass so tones don't modulate as much as higher frequency tones do with phase modulation. FM, it's all the same. Phase shift keying is another kind of modulation that is used uh, primarily for data signals. Uh, and it conveys information by changing the relative phase of a carrier signal. Notice there's no blue here, so I don't believe there's much of a test question on this other than knowing that PSK stands for phase shift keying. Another kind of adding information or modulation, uh, adding information to a radio signal is frequency shift keying. And this is used for radio teletype. Uh, and in this case, there are actually two tones being sent alternately by your radio. Uh, there's a, a lower tone and a higher tone, a mark tone and a space tone. And um, these are controlled by a uh, terminal connected to your radio or a uh, computer connected to your radio, and it transmits radio teletype. The same kind of stuff that you might remember in the old newsrooms. Those were teletype machines connected to phone lines. Well, you can have those teletype machines connected via radio as well. So reviewing some modulation things, Morse code goes the farthest for the power used. That's the, that's the rule. Single sideband is the voice mode that goes the farthest. Remember, Strategic Air Command was looking into it. There are some newer digital voice modes uh, that are coming out um, and used on VHF and UHF primarily. Uh, we're not going to talk about them much here tonight. FM, we say, has the clearest voice quality because it's immune to noise impulses. 
Um, digital modes use FM, PSK, and FSK, and can transmit text files using those modulation modes. And packet radio uses FM on VHF and UHF frequencies. So here I am in this wonderful studio <laughs> that uh, we've built and put together. Uh, and um, I, I, I love the fact that in 2023, you know, when we're, we're shooting this video, that here in this studio, I have more television production power than I did when I was working as an engineer at a TV station up in Michigan. And that facility cost millions and millions of dollars. This costs a few thousand dollars, but technology is wonderful. Uh, and uh, so we can do a lot of things now uh, that we wouldn't even have considered back in the day, because back in the day, we were using analog television. And amateur radio operators are still using analog uh, fast scan TV on UHF frequencies. Amateur fast scan TV, it's the same as the old analog TV signals used by broadcasters. Uh, it was put together by the National Television Systems Committee, NTSC or when I was an engineer at the TV station, we called it never twice the same color. It's used by amateurs in the UHF bands. Believe it or not, at television, um, the analog television that we watched for years and years, that was an AM signal. Uh, and uh, it uses something called vestigial sideband. We'll, we'll look at that here in a second. Fast scan TV used by amateur radio operators and by the old broadcasters occupied six megahertz of bandwidth. That's big. That's a lot of bandwidth. And uh, that's why it's restricted to UHF frequencies and above. And the breakdown of that six megahertz wide signal, six megahertz, see? Here's the radio frequency carrier. Here is the black and white signal. Here's the color signal. There's an FM audio carrier that's put up on the very top end of that. And this is the upper side band. Notice it's full and complete, the upper side band. The lower side band is truncated. It only goes down 1.25 megahertz and is a vestige of the upper side band. That's why we call it vestigial side band. Okay, we covered a lot. Let's see how much we can recall. Uh, go ahead and unmute and you can answer the questions as we go along. If you're uh, one of these uh, smarties who knows the answer right away, hold back and let somebody else uh, get, get a chance to answer a question. All right. Which of the following is a form of amplitude modulation? D. No. E. Not B. Charlie. Yes. Charlie. Single sideband. Remember that the amplitude modulation has a lower sideband, an upper sideband, and a carrier signal? Well, single sideband is part of that family. So a single sideband is a form of amplitude modulation. So what type of modulation is commonly used for VHF packet radio? Is it B? No. That's the little handy Alpha. talkies. Alpha. Alpha. A. Yeah, FM. A. A uh, FM or phase modulation. A, FM or PM. Yep. So which type of voice mode is often used for long distance weak signal contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? We're talking about voice mode. C. Yes. C. Here we go. Darn single it. sideband. And this is what I like to do. This is I'm a single sideband guy. So which type of modulation is commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeators? SSB. D, FM, PM. Yeah, using the repeaters, we're using those little handy talkies. And so those are FM uh, radios. So FM getting into the repeaters. And which of the following types of signal has the narrowest bandwidth? SS, uh, SSB voice. Charlie. Charlie, Morse code Charlie. is only 150 hertz wide. Oh, yes. Remember, single sideband is 3,000 hertz wide. So, yep, CW. 
and which sideband is normally used for 10 meter high frequency uh, VHF and UHF single sideband communications? Alpha A. So 10, 10 meters, if we go back to our chart, it's uh, uh, 28 megahertz, it's above 9 megahertz, so we use upper sideband. This is by convention. You could use lower sideband, but the problem is if you get on 10 meters and use lower sideband, everybody else is listening on upper sideband. And remember I told you how the audio spectrum inverts? They'll hear you, but you'll, they'll, you'll sound like Donald Duck and they won't know what's going on and they won't come back to you probably. So by convention, above nine megahertz, upper sideband, uh, below nine megahertz, lower sideband. All right. What is a characteristic of single sideband compared to FM? A narrower bandwidth. C. C is correct. Remember, single sideband signals have a three kilohertz bandwidth, whereas FM has about a 15 kilohertz bandwidth. And single sideband signals are difficult to tune, <laughs> and single sideband signals are susceptible to interference, so it couldn't be those two. What is the approximate bandwidth of a typical single sideband voice signal? Oh, I just said this. It's kilohertz. What did you say? Six kilohertz? No. Three. Three, half of that. Remember, six kilohertz is for an AM signal. Three kilohertz is for single sideband. And what is the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM voice signal? C, 10, C, 15. Yes, C has got it. Yep, between 10 and 15 kilohertz. And what is the approximate bandwidth of AM fast scan TV transmissions? B. Beta. Yeah. Bravo. Bravo. About six megahertz NTSC signals. Better do this class again. And <laughs> what you you'll get it. What is the approximate bandwidth required to transmit a CW signal? One fifty. Beta. B. Yeah. B, 150 hertz, 150 hertz. And which of the following is a disadvantage of FM compared with single sideband? Robin. Beta? Yes, because um, only one signal can be received at a time due to that capture effect in an FM demodulator, correct? And what is CW? Morse code. Which would be? D. D. Yep, it's another name for Morse code. Very good. So we cover a lot of different stuff here, but remember, we focus in on the test questions. These are the actual test questions that will be on the test and the actual answers that will be on the test as well. The answers will be in different orders, however. So don't rec memorize B or A or D. That won't do it. But these are the, the questions and the answers. And, and with this, you can uh, um, you know, get the information uh, that you need to pass the test. All right, let's move on to sections uh, 5.2, transmitters what? and receivers. And I keep, I'm gonna keep muting you. <laughs> I wanna keep your background noise out until we get to the uh, section, unless you've got a question. Does anybody got a question? All right, KSL, can I ask you to mute yourself? Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, transmitters and receivers. Ah, the old CB. I don't know if that's a 23 channel or a 40 channel. They came along and they added more channels. CB radios have a, a knob here and then when you turn it, it goes click, 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 click. Because uh, they used to be crystal controlled. Uh, you operated on specific frequencies, specific channels. One big difference with ham radio is we have what I call the big knob. Uh, so this guy right here, it's the control for a variable frequency oscillator. And so our signal that we receive and transmit on is continuously variable with inside an amateur radio band. 
Now also on CB radios, a common control was the squelch control. Um, they had this guy here. What a squelch control does is you turn it up and if you turn it down, you'll just get static and noise all the time. But you turn it up and then the radio will go quiet and when a carrier comes on frequency, it'll break the squelch, open it up, and you'll be able to hear a signal. So that's called carrier squelch, very common on CB uh, and uh, uh, also on, high, uh, on VHF, UHF, HTs. Uh, also have squelch controls. On some HF radios, actually I own this radio, it's in my truck, they also have, it's kind of hard to see, but that's a squelch control. Uh, I don't use it, and most high frequency radios, people don't use their squelch control, but just know that it does exist, and it operates on the principle that I just described. If there's no signal on frequency and you have the squelch turned up, your radio will be completely silent. But if a signal comes up on frequency, then the radio will open up and you'll be able to hear that signal. That's carrier operated squelch. There are other types. And for mobile radios and handy talkies, they, they make the most use of squelch uh, for the two meter band, the 70 centimeter band, and, and, and all of the others. So carrier operated squelch is one. Another is called CTCSS or tone squelch. Uh, and it may be that you want to work that repeater up on Caesar's Head Mountain. Uh, well, that's a bad example because that repeater doesn't require a tone. Um, but there, are, there may be a repeater here in Anderson, for example, Anderson County, that you want to get into that repeater. Um, but the repeater has PL tone access or, or tone squelch. And what that means is until you, to get your signal into that repeater and being retransmitted, you have to transmit your voice and you have to transmit a sub-audible tone, 125 hertz or 91.5 hertz, something like that. That's called a PL tone or tone squelch, also known as CTCSS. Uh, and um, it, it's commonly used, it, um, You'll hear it uh, on uh, HTs as well. It doesn't encrypt or encode the transmission. People listening on frequency can still hear it, uh, but uh, without that PL tone, the repeater won't work. Uh, and uh, so how do you know what you know, the repeater requires? Well, you'll look in a repeater directory. Uh, there are books published uh, by the American Radio Relay League. There's also a number of apps on smartphones that you can download. Uh, repeater book is one. Um, Radio Reference has got information. Uh, so there's lots of places you can go uh, to find uh, out what kind of uh, PL tones or CTCSS tones are required uh, to get into a repeater. So you're, you're trying to receive a very weak FM signal and you don't know if they're there or not. Here's some advice. If you're trying to receive a weak signal, turn the squelch off or down. If you turn the squelch off, then you can he start hearing weak signals. Whereas if you have squelch on, you're only going to hear the stronger signals. So we talked about adding information to a radio frequency carrier, which is modulation. Uh, and modulation requires a, a source of information. So there's various input devices that can be used to provide a source of modulation for your radio. Uh, we looked at some of these, Morse code key, for example. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, way, uh, a paddle uh, to, uh, to send Morse code. Microphones uh, for voice use. Uh, keyboards, which you can use for both radio teletype and even sending CW. Um, know that um, you can send Morse code using, uh, this is called an iambic paddle made by Pen Bencher a Corporation, the BY1, and this is plugged into a box like this, which is an electronic keyer. Uh, and on this paddle, if you hit it on the left side, it might send dits, and if you hit it on the right side, it might send das, and by alternating back and forth between them, you can send fully formed Morse code characters. Sometimes your radio will have an electronic keyer built in already. You don't need an external box like this one. But know that these things exist. All right, Gary, I've got this radio. 
It's an ICOM radio, and it's got this 8-pin microphone connector on the front. Well, I don't have an 8-pin um, ICOM microphone, but I have an 8-pin Yesu microphone. Can I plug it in there? And the answer is probably not. Um, while many of them use the same kind of connector on the front of their radios, they didn't use one standard. Uh, and so an ICOM microphone won't necessarily work in a Yesu and vice versa. And so you'll find there are all sorts of adapters and, and uh, plugs and things to, to make things work, or you have to rewire it yourself. Um, Heil Radio sends a bunch, sells a bunch of adapters uh, where you can plug in headsets and other things into various radios. That's, that's what this is all about here. Um, so just be aware uh, that that 8-pin connector is going to contain you know, the microphone signal. It'll have a, a push-to-talk signal. It may also have some frequency control signals. And not every microphone will work with every radio. So it just kind of complicates things. One thing you do want to make sure if you're going to be doing voice work is to keep your, your gain through the audio stages uh, not too low, not too high, but as they said, just right. You want to, well, like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you want to keep it just right. Because if you've got too much gain, you're going to get distortion. Uh, and uh, people will call you out on it, actually. So, so don't do that. All right, high frequency transceivers. Now, I don't know about you. There's a lot of knobs and buttons and stuff on this high frequency transceiver panel. I love it. I think that's great. But some people are intimidated by it. So, OK, not everybody is the same. But let's talk over some of the things that are on this front panel of this is an Elecraft uh, K3. So the big knob, we already talked about that. That's the variable frequency oscillator. And that's one way that you can set your operating frequency. Some radios also have, in fact, I think this one does, have a keypad. See it right there? And you can actually key in your frequency directly. So that's another way uh, that you can um, uh, change your frequency. There's also a third way, if you've memorized a frequency into one of the memories built into the radio, you can recall a frequency from memory uh, and also change your frequency that way. Now, most high frequency radios are what they call multi-mode radios. So that radio can send and receive AM, six kilohertz wide, single sideband, three kilohertz wide, Morse code, 150 hertz wide, FM, between 10 and 15 kilohertz wide, radio teletype, which is probably about 400 hertz wide, and other various data modes. So uh, that's a multi-mode radio. Uh, that's in contrast to the little handy talkies, the little HTs, which are FM radios only. As I mentioned, they probably have memory channels, 500 to 1,000, uh, that can hold preset frequencies and mode settings. So you can memorize a, a net uh, that you want to operate on every day and just recall it from memory. It can operate on more than one frequency band. Most HF radios will operate between 160 meters, or 1.8 megahertz, all the way up to the 6 meter band, or 50 megahertz. So HF transceivers are generally multi band. And we talked about you can uh, adjust and receive transmit frequency using the VFO or keypad direct entry. So transceiver is a combination of transmitter and receiver. And I think we saw the Kenwood twins back in the day. They used to have separate boxes for receive and transmit. Um, but transceiver has them both in the same one. And some re receiver terms to know about uh, sensitivity. That's the ability to detect a signal. And selectivity is the ability to separate a signal from others that are close in frequency. So uh, these are two characteristics, prime characteristics of a good receiver. You want one with good sensitivity and also good selectivity. Now, for controls for the receiver, you're going to have an AF gain control, <laughs> a fancy term, audio frequency. It's a volume control. OK, AF gain control. Older radios, like my old Heathkit Mohawk, uh, 
uh, used to have an intermediate frequency gain control. Most radios now don't have those anymore. They might have, though, intermediate frequency bandwidth and high cut or low cut settings uh, to tune uh, the characteristics of uh, the signal you're receiving. May have a, a selection for a filter for the intermediate frequency. And you want to select a filter that is the appropriate bandwidth according to the mode. So if you're operating AM, you don't want a single sideband filter. Remember, AM is 6 kilohertz wide. Single sideband is only 3 kilohertz wide. You're not going to receive the full signal. So you, you want to match a filter setting to the mode uh, that you're trying to operate. There is probably a radio frequency gain control, which is kind of like a, a volume control for the front end of the radio that controls the amount of gain uh, right close to the antenna. Uh, and that can be helpful sometimes in, in getting the best received quality. Uh, a receiver might have a notch filter. Uh, that's a, a device that uh, can actually uh, block uh, carrier tones, uh, high-pitched tones that might be in the passband. You can eliminate them. Uh, and um, and then makes listening a, a lot easier. And an attenuator uh, that uh, reduces interference from strong signals. And as we mentioned about filters, you want to match the transmitted bandwidth for the best reception. So use a, a single sideband filter for single sideband, like 3 kilohertz, or um, a CW filter, um, which might be much narrower, down to 150 hertz or 300 hertz, something like that. Something else that receivers will have is the automatic gain control. And I highly recommend you don't turn it off. Um, you can. There's a switch usually. Uh, and um, old timers used to say, I never turn my AGC on. I listen with my radio wide open all the time. And you ask them a question about it and they say, hey? you lose your hearing, especially if you're, you're wearing headphones. So AGC, you lose it, and uh, use it or lose it because uh, it keeps audio at a constant level without deafening you. Automatic gain control. Some other controls that are receiver-oriented. Uh, receiver incremental tuning, RIT. It's a fine tuning control for reception. So uh, you're keeping your, um, the big knob on one frequency, but you can take this little knob and, and tune it to, to improve your reception while keeping your transmitting frequency unchanged. So that's being controlled by the big knob. Uh, and single sideband voice can be made to sound normal if the other guy is slightly off frequency. So that's receiver incremental tuning. Very handy to have. And on your receivers, you're going to have an S meter. S meters are associated with receivers. And it's used to indicate received signal strength. And so uh, it's up to S units, up to S9. And then it goes in plus 10, plus 20, plus 30 dB. Um, so up here, it's just um, S9, S8, S7, S6. Each S unit, as we counted them off, 5, 6, 7, each change is represents 6 dB in signal strength change, or four times the power. So for me, if somebody else at the far location says, hey, Gary, you're coming in as an, at an S5, and I'm transmitting with 100 watts, in order for me to get it up to an S6, I would have to transmit on the next go around 400 watts, four times the power. And the standard is 6 dB per S unit. Some radios are not well calibrated that way, but 6 dB is the thing to know. Noise blankers uh, generally are used uh, for mobile operations, and it can remove ignition uh, noise, uh, pulses, spark pulses, things like that. And what it does is it squelches the audio stage during noise peak. So it actually blocks out the audio during that time. It makes the, the signal much more listenable. You don't have to listen to all the popping and crackling. Remember I mentioned I used to have a, an older radio, a Heath Mohawk, all tube type, big. It weighed about 100 pounds. Oh, man, it, but it was glorious. It was my first ham radio receiver. 
And oh, I just enjoyed the heck out of that. When I was a novice, uh, that's what I used uh, to, to listen to signals coming from uh, around the United States. But it had one drawback. It was all tube, remember? And it didn't hear very well on the upper frequency bands. Um, I could operate on, as a novice, 80 meters and 40 meters and 15 meters. The radio didn't hear very well up on 15 meters. And what I had to do is I had to add a receiver preamplifier, an RF preamplifier. And this is actually the one I, I got. It's an Amico uh, tube type unit. Uh, and it installs between the antenna and the receiver, the transmit receive switch was uh, before this. And uh, so, and this would amplify signals coming from my antenna. And suddenly, then my Heath Mohawk could actually hear signals on 15 meters. It made a really big difference. Most modern radios uh, that you buy today don't require this, but you'll see these being sold at ham fests uh, on a regular basis. All right, those are receiver terms. Let's talk about some transmitter terms. So this is a Yesu um, uh, high frequency uh, transceiver, and it's likely gonna have a microphone gain control uh, that generally is set once and forget it. It's also gonna have some speech processor settings that to maybe add compression, uh, do some equalization on the audio. Uh, the whole point of that is to raise the average power of the audio signal to be able to be heard uh, a long distance away better. Um, it also may have an RF power level control, so you could operate this radio from, say, 5 watts up to uh, 100 watts is probably the maximum output on this radio. So uh, you can control the output uh, power uh, from 5 watts uh, to 100 watts. And since we're talking about mics and speech processors, we're talking about single sideband here uh, on this radio. Now, if I want to go over 100 watts, this radio won't do it. What you do is you add something called a power amplifier, or RF power amplifier, also known as a linear power amplifier. A linear power amplifier means it amplifies the signal that comes into it exactly the way uh, it came in. It, it amplifies everything. And this little uh, uh, Elecraft KPA 500 will uh, take you up to 500 watts output. So you probably run about 40 watts in, and you get about 500 watts out. Uh, and uh, so that'll be about an S unit increase. It might be just exactly what you need uh, to get um, uh, to be able to be heard at the, at the far end, especially with single sideband. And you can get these RF amplifiers. This is one for HF up to six meters. You can also get them for VHF and UHF, uh, and they're called power bricks. Uh, this might be a, a hundred watt uh, unit. I think it's, uh, I think it says 100 right there. So um, you, you put in maybe 10 watts in and get 100 watts out. And notice it's got a mode switch here on, on the front because you can actually set this up to be uh, proper for single sideband in the lower position or in the upper position for FM. Uh, it uh, changes the way the amplifier works. FM does not require a linear amplifier. Uh, it can actually work with something called a non-linear amplifier, and, and you can get actually more output power. So to, to transmit FM through this, you'd put it up at the FM position. And power, what are we talking about? Well, just know that uh, for these modes, CW, FM, radio teletype, and data, it, it's continuous power. Uh, it's uh, the same radio frequency po carrier power all the time in these modes. Whereas with AM and single sideband, where we're modulating the amplitude, then we talk about power's uh, uh, peak envelope power. We won't talk about how to calculate all that. That's something we do in the general class. But just be aware of that. And here's a, a chain, a transmitter chain, a transceiver chain uh, going uh, through a linear amplifier, maybe a low-pass filter to reduce harmonics, maybe a standing wave bridge to, to know how well your antenna is doing, uh, a dummy load, which is a test antenna, uh, or you can switch it to an antenna tuner and then out to an antenna. This is, this is kind of the, a block diagram of a, a typical a transceiver connection uh, to an antenna. Now, we mentioned the, the amplifier here. Um, what happens if you send too much 
power to the linear amplifier. Well, number one, you'll be what we call overdriving the amplifier. And it will you know, clip the signal. Uh, the amplifier can only go so far, and it causes distortion and spurious output and output on harmonic frequencies. So if you're transmitting on 7 megahertz, say, uh, when you clip it like this, you might also be end up transmitting on 14 megahertz, the second harmonic. And, and you can measure that on a, a spectrum analyzer. You can see here's the, the primary carrier, and here's, here's some of the harmonics uh, that are coming out of an overdriven uh, amplifier. To test your amplifier, we always recommend that you use a dummy load. It's a test antenna. Uh, it may be a, a non-inductive resistor in a can of mineral oil. That's what this is, a paint can filled with mineral oil and a non-inductive 50 ohm resistor. Or you can build your own. People make their own. And you can find smaller ones that connect, connect up to HTs uh, so that you can test the radio without actually transmitting a signal. Hang in there. We will have a break here tonight, We're coming up here shortly. Uh, but there's a lot of information uh, contained in this chapter. And as you can imagine, computers and ham radio, there's a huge uh, amount of things that uh, computers are involved in. Uh, you can use them for logging contacts, sending and receiving Morse code, sending and receiving digital signals. There's software-defined radios now that use uh, computers uh, to control them. Uh, you can connect them to your antenna analyzer and print out uh, standing wave uh, ratio charts. Uh, you can op your, operate your station remotely over the internet. I uh, used to do this uh, regularly. Um, and um, computer sound cards that are built into computers are used for digital modes, such as PSK32, FT8, FT4, uh, because the computer sound cards convert audio to digital. Now, if you don't have a sound card in your radio, you can also buy radio interfaces, which are kind of like sound cards that uh, connect up to your computer via USB or some other method. Um, and these radio interfaces provide three signals that a radio needs for radio teletype or one of the other uh, data modes. It sends uh, audio from the radio back to uh, the, this box and then to the computer or you need to send audio to the radio from this box, and it has to uh, control the radio, transmit, or receive. It's called push to talk, and usually it's a, a, a control line that when it's grounded, uh, the radio will go into transmit, uh, when it's shorted to ground, when it's open, uh, then uh, the radio is in receive. So these are the three control signals that go from one of these radio interfaces uh, uh, to uh, a radio, uh, and this connects up to your computer. Now, some radios, like I mentioned the IC7300, which is a great radio, um, and it's available, uh, it's a current uh, production, uh, has a USB connector right on the back. So it has an interface built in, and all you need to do is get a USB cable to connect this to your computer, and boom, you're ready to go. Uh, with any of the data, the digital uh, modes, uh, it just works. That's great. So this radio will work from 160 meters all the way up to 6 meters, 50 megahertz. But what if you want to work like on the 2 meter band? You want to do a 2 meter single side band. But, and you could buy a new radio, a 2 meter multi-mode radio, or you could buy one of these. This is called a transverter. This is made by Elecraft as well. And it converts both transmit and receive to a different band. So you set your transceiver to the 10 meter band, typically, and run signals into this box. And it'll come out of this box on 2 meters. And then receive signals from 2 meters come into this box and go out of the box on 10 meters to your transceiver. So you can get on a different band without having to buy a whole new radio by using a transverter. Okay, here's some questions. Let's see how we do. Why should you not set your transmit frequency to be exactly at the edge of an amateur band or sub band? And I'm going to say read carefully. D. <laughs> You'll learn that when I say read carefully, that's what it means. 
to allow for calibration error in the transmitter frequency display so that modulation sidebands do not extend beyond the band edge, we looked at that, and to allow for transmitter frequency drift, yeah, the answer is all of these choices are correct. And what would cause your FM transmission audio to be distorted on voice peaks? Sorry. See? Yeah, you're talking too loudly. You actually reduce your gain uh, by talking softer. And what is the purpose of a squelch function? B. B. Bravo. Yep, to mute the receiver audio when a signal is not present. You don't want to listen to that white noise all the time, so that's where the, the squelch comes in. And what is an electronic keyer? C, Charlie? Yeah, we, we hooked up that bencher paddle, uh, and you could send uh, dits or uh, DAS. Yep, a device that assists in manual sending of Morse code. What is the effect of excessive microphone gain on SSB transmissions? B. Yeah, too Bobby. much of a too much of a good thing is going to give you distorted audio. Yeah. And which of the following can be used to enter a transceiver's operating frequency? Alpha. C. We had uh, we heard alpha and then we heard Charlie, but um, alpha, you can use the big knob, the VFO knob, or the keypad for direct frequency entry. You could also recall from memory, but that's not one of the selections here. Automatic frequency control generally has to do with FM, uh, and it's uh, part of the uh, demodulator it captures the signal. So how is squelch adjusted so that a weak FM signal can be heard? It's a long answer to actually turn squelch off. It's set the squelch threshold so that receiver output audio is on all the time. Then you can hear the weakest signals, because if you have squelch on, only stronger signals are going to get through. And what is, the, what is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency or channel on your transceiver? B, stored in memory channel? Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, storing it in a memory channel. You can store the frequency, the mode, uh, any other uh, settings that your radio can, can memorize. So which of the following controls could be used if the voice pitch of a single sideband uh, re signal returning to your CQ call seems too high or too low? Clarifier? D? Yes, the receiver incremental tuning is what we talked about. It's also known as a clarifier. It's a fine-tuning control that only affects receive frequency. Yeah. And what is the advantage of having multiple receive bandwidth choices on a multi-mode transceiver? How wide a filter would you want if you're on single sideband? How wide a filter would you want if you're trying to receive AM? Six. You got the numbers. It, so let's bravo. take take a look at bravo. Yeah, bravo. Permits noise or interference reduction by selecting a bandwidth matching the mode. You wouldn't want a six kilohertz filter to listen to a three kilohertz wide single sideband signal because you'd pick up lots of extra noise and signals you're not interested in. So you want to match the filter uh, bandwidth to the mode that you're trying to operate. 
And which of the following receiver filter bandwidths would provide the best signal to noise ratio for single sideband reception? 2400. So we said single sideband is about three kilohertz wide, but 2400 is a common filter size for single sideband. So yes, that's the one that you would pick. And what is the result of tuning an FM receiver above or below a signal's frequency? I don't know if you've ever done this on uh, just broadcast FM. It doesn't change the pitch of the signal. It has nothing to do with sideband inversion. It doesn't generate any tones. It just sounds bad. It's distortion of the signal's audio. And which term describes the ability of a receiver to detect the presence of a signal? Sensitivity. Sensitivity. Yep, that's sensitivity. Yes, indeed. And which term describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals? Charlie, selectivity. That's selectivity, yes, indeed. And what device converts the RF input and output, input and output, of a transceiver to another band? Charlie, transverter. That's the transverter. Yeah. And what is the function of a transceiver's PTT input? can't see the question oh, again. Man. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right. Let me let me do something here. I meant this that's the only saving grace of the old software we were using is that I could um, select spotlight easily. I meant to do this at the start of the class. This is my fault. I apologize. Okay. No worries. I that agree. should be a little Bravo. better. Is it Bravo. Yeah. Bravo. And so it switches the transceiver from receive to transmit when grounded. If people on YouTube are going, what the heck did he just do? I just put the spotlight function on on Zoom, um, which um, I used to be able to do with a push button. I can't do it anymore. Oh, so what is the function of the SSB stroke CWFM switch on a VHF power brick? Yes, Charlie. Uh, no. No, it's no. Um, you actually you actually change the bias of the amplifier um, uh, from a class A to a class C amplifier. It sets the amplifier for proper operation yes. in the selected mode. Uh, you can amplify FM signals with class C, but you must amplify single sideband signals with class A. That's that's what happens. And what device increases the transmitted output power of a transceiver? Bravo. Yep, that's an RF power amplifier or linear amplifier. So on the other side, where is an RF preamplifier installed? Alpha. Between the antenna and receiver. Yeah, that's my old Heath Mohawk that was kind of deaf on 15 meters. I had to put an RF preamplifier between the antenna and the receiver, and then I could amplify the signal and receive. So, what can you do if you are told your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over deviating? <laughs> I guess. D, talk for further away from the mic. That is correct. Um, over devi <laughs> when, when you're, you're generating the FM signal, you're deviating the carrier frequency. If you're over deviating, you're, you're, it's going too far. One way to combat that is just talk farther away from the microphone. Very good. And what is the primary purpose of a dummy load? Alpha. Alpha, indeed, to prevent transmitting signals over the air when making tests. And what does a dummy load consist of? Bravo. A non-inductive resistor, uh, uh, 50 ohm load uh, generally, mounted on or in 
a heat a medium or heat sink. Uh, so it could be a, a paint can uh, containing mineral oil, which is uh, what is called a cantenna. And we made it to the intermission. I am so proud of you. So please go ahead and let, we'll take five minutes uh, and to get up and move around, get a drink of water or whatever, and uh, come on back and we'll finish out the chapter. You're doing great. There's a lot of material here. I'm so proud of you. Uh, I think you're learning more than you actually realize. So let's take five minutes and we'll be right back.
we are back. I'm very proud of you. I know a lot of people are going, my head is hurting from all of this information. We move at this pace because we're trying to cover all of the test questions uh, that are, uh, you know, covered in this chapter. We're trying to get through them all and provide you with context and information about what is the right answer and why it's the right answer. Um, I tell you, when I first got started teaching uh, ham radio classes, I, I taught a general class, and I taught it um, like a, an electronics class where I, you know, a lot of background and a lot of theory, and I didn't teach any of the questions. I figured the students would read the questions then and understand them, and when the students all went to take their test, no one passed. Zero. <laughs> so we changed. So that's why we concentrate on the test questions, making sure you see all the test questions, uh, have you repeat back you know, what the answers are. It's far more effective for you to be able to pass the test. So we're not torturing you. <laughs> that's not what we're trying to do. Um, but we're, we're trying to give you the information that you need uh, in order to pass the test. All right, let's, let's get out of here. We've got mm, maybe another uh, well, I won't tell you. I'll, a few more slides to go. All right. Um, push the right button. There we go. Digital communications. Oh, my gosh. This is a, this is a huge uh, thing. Back in the day, we talked about radio teletype, you know, the, the things that used to be in the newsrooms. Well, here's uh, one of those with the cover off, and this is actually a transmitting um, terminal as well. So it's got a keyboard uh, of sorts, a typewriter there on the front. Uh, man, these electromechanical devices, uh, th this is how teletype got its start, uh, whether it be connected to um, teletype lines from Ma Bell or on the radio. Um, so Morse code and radio teletype both got their starts as electromechanical devices. But there was evolution, and over time, Morse code and radio teletype could be sent and received by purely electronic devices. And this was a, an innovation at the time, uh, a device that could uh, send and receive radio teletype um, without wanting, having to have one of those uh, mechanical monsters. And now with computers, um, you've got software that you can run on your computer, uh, and uh, Morse code and radio teletype can both be sent and received using software you know, on your, your, your PC. We talked about packet radio earlier. Um, I consider it to be the first uh, true digital mode. Uh, I believe it dates from about the 1970s. Uh, and uh, it used um, VHF primarily uh, with the FM transceivers. So here's the transceiver, the terminal node controller, and a, a dumb terminal or a terminal software running on a computer. Um, and uh, it used a networking protocol. Uh, it was known as X.25 in the commercial world. But for amateur radio, it was amateur X.25. Uh, and inside that packet containing the information, there was a, a header and a checksum and the data that you were trying to send, the characters. And then there was an automatic request uh, such that if the packet made it through to its de destination, the, the destination radio would uh, send an acknowledgment back saying, yep, got it. Or if it didn't receive it, it would send a request back to resend it. I didn't get it. Uh, so that's all part of the uh, packet radio protocol. Packet radio is still being used today, but not for its original intention. Um, it evolved to something called the APRS system. It's the Automatic Packet Reporting System, uh, which adds a GPS receiver. And uh, now, uh, with a packet terminal, a TNC, which can be as small as this, a little handheld radio, uh, a GPS uh, receive antenna, um, you can transmit location and short text messages uh, weather data, uh, there are some uh, at remote locations that send wind speed and temperature and things like that. And all of that information can be actually viewed at this website on the internet, aprs.fi. Uh, and you'll actually see hams, you can uh, zoom in on your area, uh, and hams who have APRS activated, for example, in their cars, you can actually see where they're driving. So if you've got somebody coming over to visit you and you know they're on APRS, you can track them 
and know when they're going to get right to your door. That's the automatic packet reporting system. Other fun things you can do on Radio Now are you can send and receive emails using something called WinLink. Uh, it's a global radio email service. Uh, it uses high frequency and VHF, UHF, and it uses gateway stations that uh, connect to the internet, to the public internet, and take uh, amateur email messages and put them on the public internet and vice versa. Uh, that's WinLink, and you can follow the link here uh, and get more information. There are lots of other digital modes on the high frequencies. Uh, below the 10 meter band, though, we're limited to 300 baud uh, for the symbol rate. Remember, that's that telephone modem rate that I talked about before for the, the bulletin board systems. Um, radio teletype doesn't use um, computer code, which is uh, ASCII. It uses its own 5-bit code called Bodo. Uh, just be aware of that. Uh, there's something called Pactor, uh, which uh, uses frequency shift keying and automatic request to send and repeat request uh, on HF radio. Um, this is the WinLink system, um, WinLink messaging over radio. And then uh, PSK32, I don't like it. 31 there, is a keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard mode um, that is no longer the most popular, it used to be, but no longer the most popular uh, data mode on uh, HF. This is something called FT8. And there's one of the guys who's responsible for it, Joe Taylor, a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and ham radio operator, uh, who developed this software. Uh, called WSJTX. Uh, and you can download the software for free. Uh, it's now on SourceForge. It used to be hosted by Princeton University, which is where um, he was a professor. Um, and it got started back in, I think, 2001, uh, when he built it for Earth, Moon, Earth uh, uh, connections. Hams would bounce signals on two meters up to the moon and receive signals coming back from the moon, but it used to require huge satellite antennas and high power, 1500 watts. Well, what this software does is it trades time for power. So it takes you know uh, several minutes to decode a signal, but you don't need to have those huge antennas anymore, and you don't need to be transmitting at ultra high power. Uh, so WSJTX software has uh, got a number of these very interesting digital modes available to it. Another one is called Whisper. It's a propagation software. You can transmit with like 100 milliwatts and see where your signal goes all around the Earth. Um, there's a meteor scatter mode and many, many more, but FT8 uh, is the one that has taken uh, the world by storm. It is the most popular digital mode uh, on radio. And the F is for Steve Frankie, T is for Joe Taylor, the co-developer, so there was also a British ham, um, and it uses uh, eight frequency shift keying format, eight, eight signal tones, but it only occupies 50 hertz of bandwidth. So this is the mode that is taking over from Morse code as far as the amount of uh, distance it can get for uh, the amount of power uh, that you, you send. It's a weak signal mode that can hear barely audible or even inaudible signals. Back when the bands were completely closed, FT8 was the only way you could actually still make contacts. Uh, and it's great for low power DX to make contacts. And that's the rub. A lot of old timers don't like FT8 because FT8 is a contact. It's not a conversation. There's no way you can actually have a conversation with FT8. All it sends is your call sign, uh, signal report, uh, your location, your maidenhead grid square, and boom, you've made a valid contact when you've exchanged that information with the other ham. And of course, hams are innovative, and some hams figured out, I could make this run automatically by hacking the software. So then there's this. How is FT8 working out for you as they sit on the dock? Well, my computer is working Asia right now. 
Uh, that's another reason that the old timers don't like it. <laughs> but I came around. I didn't like it at first, but I like it now. So some terms uh, of art for digital. Uh, bit error rate. Uh, you want to have the lowest bit error rate possible. You want to make sure that all your, your data gets through uh, undistorted, uh, undisturbed. Um, a parity bit is something that can be added to the data to, used for error checking. Uh, a digipeter uh, is like in the packet radio system. It's a repeater used to relay digital communications using store and forward. Uh, Amateur satellites carrying packet radio have digipeters up there where you can send a message up to the satellite, it'll hold it, and uh, if it's addressed to another ham, and when that other ham logs into the satellite, he'll get his message. That's a digipeter. Uh, node stations uh, are, are uh, communications stations that can uh, route uh, from point to point, uh, taking shortcuts, so to speak. Uh, and phase shift keying uh, is uh, used uh, for um, different uh, data modes, including uh, PSK31. Uh, There's a radio messaging server, just RMS. We talked about the global positioning system. Nowadays, we use the universal serial bus, USB connections to our computers. But back in the day, we used serial connections over COM ports. And uh, you'll still see old equipment uh, for sale uh, utilizing this technology. And uh, for hams, we still have to deal with the RS-232 protocol uh, and uh, uh, the various pins, making sure that they're in, in the right configuration for data transfer, uh, just to let you know. Um, gateway stations, we talked about when the, in the WinLink system, they provide a connection to the internet. And bulletin board systems still exist out there uh, in amateur radio. All right, I bet you didn't know that you're operating on, on an amateur radio band right now. Your Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz is a shared band shared between non-licensed Wi-Fi and amateur radio operators. Uh, and amateur radio operators can put up their own signals on the 13 centimeter band. Uh, and we can do uh, our own mesh networks by modifying uh, these routers. Um, your router at home can transmit up to one watt, but with an amateur radio license, you can transmit up to 10 watts. Now, you can't hack your router uh, and provide internet for the neighborhood. That's not allowed. Um, the unlicensed service and the licensed service cannot communicate um, with each other, uh, but you can put up your own independent mesh network with another ham friend, that is allowed. All right, questions already? We're gonna get to go home here pretty soon. So how are the transceiver audio input and outputs connected in a station configured to, to operate using FT8? B. To the audio input and output of the computer running WSJTX software. That is correct. That's the software you need for FT8. And what signals are used in a computer radio interface for digital mode operation? We talked about it in the previous uh, grouping. Charlie. Yes, receive audio, transmit audio, and push to talk or transmitter keying. And which of the following connections is made between a computer and a transceiver which to use computer software when operating digital modes? Which one of these is a valid connection? If you want to get audio from the transceiver, a lot of times people will take it from the speaker connector and run it into the computer's line input. That goes in and that goes out. You just want to make sure that you got the, the right. You wouldn't want the computer's line out uh, going to the transceiver speaker. That would be two outputs connected together. This is the only one that makes any logical sense. But I know gotcha. it, it's not obvious. So what is an amateur radio station that connects other amateur stations to the internet? What is it called? Alpha. Repeater. Yeah, that's a, no, no, it's not a repeater, it's a gateway. 
And which of the following is a digital communications mode? Read carefully. All of them. You may not realize this is Wi-Fi. This is uh, the technical name for Wi-Fi, IEEE 802.11. <laughs> so packet radio, yes. Wi-Fi is digital, yes. FT8 is digital. All of those choices are correct. Trick question. Exactly. What kind of data can be transmitted by APRS? All of them. Yep, all of them. GPS position data, text messages, and weather data could all be transmitted. And which of the following is an application of APRS? Alpha. Alpha is correct. Real-time tactical digital communications, it could be weather information or it could be the status of a race uh, that you're covering uh, in conjunction with a map showing the locations of stations. Yep. And what does the abbreviation PSK mean? Phase. B, phase. Phase shift keying. Uh, it was early on that we mentioned that. Wee. And which of the following is included in packet radio transmissions? All right, I didn't tell you that oh. the, the header contains your call sign. That's how your, your transmission is identified. And a checksum and a repeat request. So yes, all of those are correct. And which of the following operating activities is supported by digital mode software in the WSJTX software suite? It got started with Earth, Moon, Earth. It's all of them. Earth, Moon, Earth, all of them. Weak Signal, and Meteor Scatter, all of those. And what is an ARQ transmission system? Packet Radio is one. If the receiving station gets the data, okay. If the receiving station does not get the data, it will send a request yeah, for retransmission, an ARQ system. Okay. Not easy. Yep. And which of the following best describes an amateur radio mesh network? You can take that Linksys router and modify it up to 10 watts output. It is an amateur radio-based data network. You and your buddy can set up your own network using commercial Wi-Fi equipment with modified firmware. I didn't go deep into that. Okay. I got to add some slides for that. So what is FT8? Bravo. Yes, it's a digital mode capable of low signal to noise operation. Uh, it can actually hear signals that you can't hear with your own ear. It uses the power of the computer to process the signal. All right, I think this is the last section. Section 5.4, power supplies and batteries. So there are some ham radios that have built-in 120 volt power supplies. Not very many. Most ham radios operate on 12 volts. Uh, or we say 12 volts, um, and uh, so they require a power supply uh, that can convert 120 volts to 12 volts at a sufficient current rating. Uh, so for um, VHF, UHF units, you, you probably want to have a, a power supply of about 20 amps for um, uh, 15 to 20 amps for um, a high frequency transceiver, a 100 watt radio, probably up to about 30 amps. Um, and when we say 12 volt power supplies, it's really 13.8 volts. That's what they're all adjusted for, because that's the voltage of a, a battery in your car that it has a, is being charged by the alternator. So that's a nominal voltage for your car battery, 13.8 volts. And you can buy these uh, 
power supplies uh, from ham radio stores. Um, conventional versus switching types. Uh, conventionals are big and heavy because they contain big power transformers. They're very hard to move around. Switching or switch mode power supplies like this little Alinko are very lightweight because they don't use big power transformers. They actually use um, switching supplies that operate at like 50 kilohertz and require smaller components, smaller transformers. And again, for VHF, UHF, 13.8 volts at 15 amps is probably what you need. If you're going to go for a 100 watt HF transceiver, you need a power supply rated at 30 amps. And these are all, both of these types are regulated, so they, they keep the voltage constant at 13.8 volts. So now, a tale of woe from yours truly. Don't buy cheap. I needed a power supply, not for my ham radio gear, but was actually for some security equipment at my old location. And I went to Amazon and, you know, I said, oh, here's one that's rated 13.8 volts at like 16 amps or whatever it was. And made in China, but okay, this should be good. This should be fine. And it worked for about a week. And unlike the more expensive Astron or Alenco or even MFJ power supplies, this power supply had no over voltage protection. And what happened is the regulating transistors overheated in this guy. They shorted out. And instead of shorting to ground, they shorted to the DC rectifier and provided instead of 13.8 volts, about 21 volts DC to my security cameras. Poof, gone. So my tale of woe is don't buy cheap Chinese power supplies. Buy name brand. If you want a recommendation, contact me and I'll tell you. <laughs> Learn from my lesson. Car batteries, we, we talked about you know, being 13.8 volts when they're, they're charging from your vehicle's alternator. Um, remember that these are lead acid batteries and they can release hydrogen gas, explosive gases, that must be vented. Uh, charging too fast can release high levels of the hydrogen and can be a, a spark hazard, it can cause fires, etc. If you're in your car um, and you want to operate a radio, you can, but you remember you're going to have to deal with probably noises from your alternator, a whining noise, uh, noises from your spark plugs, popping noise, and the vehicles, uh, all the sections are not necessarily grounded or bonded together uh, as well as they used to be, so you probably are going to have some noise. Um, if you're going to power your radio, whether it be VHF, UHF, or HF for sure, you really want to connect the power all the way back to the battery. Uh, don't try to use a, a outlet and uh, cigar cigarette outlet in the car for that, um, uh, both for noise and also for current um, um, problems, limitations. Um, also, this is just an aside, um, some engines have um, um, current sensing built into the battery negative, uh, and so sometimes uh, in order for that to come into play, uh, you, you need to um, connect the, the radio negative, um, not on the battery, but on the other side of that. That's more the information they need, needed to know. Uh, here are some batteries uh, to be aware of. And um, note that alkaline batteries are disposable. They are not rechargeable. Carbon zinc batteries are disposable. They are not rechargeable. NiCADs and nickel metal hydrides, those are rechargeable. But alkaline, no. And carbon zinc, no. And even some lithium coin cells, no, not rechargeable. Um, and you can actually cause fires uh, if you try to charge them. This is the, the newest, nicest thing on the block, the uh, life pole, as I heard it described the other day, a lithium iron uh, phosphate uh, batteries. Um, they look like the old lead acid car batteries, but they're very lightweight. They're not heavy, maybe a quarter of the weight of a lead acid battery. Um, and um, a lot of people uh, like these for emergency power. 
uh, and uh, for powering uh, ham radio uh, rigs. Note that they're rated with the voltage and an amp hour rating. And you can take this amp hour rating, and if you know the amount of current that you're going to be drawing, well, we'll just say one amp of current, well then this theoretically should run for 100 hours. So amp hours divided by the average current is the run time. That's how you do that calculation. Uh, so a lot of hams use these batteries for powering ham radio gear. Uh, hams also use generators and inverters uh, to power uh, uh, electronics. Um, re things that you have to deal with with generators or issues of voltage and frequency regulation with inverters. Uh, um, pretty much all are, are pure sine wave anymore, but uh, so the old, older ones were modified sine wave, which can't be used for sensitive electronics. And how big do you, you know, get your generator or, or batteries or whatever? Well, it all depends on uh, the radio that you're using, um, uh, the RF output stage, uh, which is going to use the, the highest amount of power on transmit, uh, how much the power is there for receive, just sitting there idle, um, and um, how uh, efficient is the design of the power supply. Uh, are there any ish inrush currents when you first turn it on? Uh, all of these things uh, will tell you how big you need to build the, the gener have the generator or your, your power source. And when you're connecting up, um, especially if you're running at 12 volts, what wire gauge? The goal is to have enough uh, thickest, the thickest wire possible um, so that you don't have a voltage drop in the wire uh, that is feeding the radio. So, you know, here's nice thick, that would be great. This kind of piddly little stuff, eh, not so good, especially if the, the run is for a long distance. You want to have a sufficiently large wire gauge to minimize voltage drop. Okay, let's answer some questions. Which of the following is an appropriate power supply rating for a typical 50 watt mobile FM transceiver? D. D. D as in dog, 13.8 volts at 12 amps. We said 15, but 12, okay, that's fine. And why are short heavy gauge wires used for a transceiver's DC power? Alpha. Yep, to minimize voltage drop when transmitting. And how can you determine the length of time that equipment can be powered from a battery? B. Yep, divide the battery ampere hour rating by the average current draw of the equipment. And where should the negative power return of a mobile transceiver be connected in a vehicle? A. A, at the 12 volt battery's chassis ground. It used to be back in the day, I'm talking about the 1960s, that you could connect the negative to any, any point of metal in the car. You can't do that anymore. And which of the following battery chemistries is rechargeable? B. B is true. All of them. All of them. Nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, and lead acid all can be recharged. And which of the following is not rechargeable? Carbon zinc? Carbon zinc, the old basic flashlight battery. Yep, can't do that. And what type of uh, circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? So, A, a we, we say we have a regulated power supply. It holds the voltage at 13.8 volts. R the regulator in the power supply holds the voltage there. And what hazard is caused by charging or discharging a battery too quickly? Overheating and gassing out? Yep, the, the hydrogen gas. And you made it, we made it to chapter five. But wait, I just want to share with you here three websites uh, to be uh, aware of. I'll come back to them here in just a second. Do you realize you're over halfway through the class now? 
Um, all of the mm -hmm. next chapters are much shorter, much easier, much lighter. So good. you're in good shape. But what I'd like you to start considering now, uh, I'm going to mute you here just for a second, um, is these websites. Uh, and I've shared this one with you before. This is the American Radio Relay League's uh, website to review test questions. Um, and you can also take practice tests there. Uh, this is another one where you can uh, review. Uh, and Tech 2022 is when the, the test came out. So even though we're in 2023, this is the same question pool. Here's another one on QRZ. Uh, so as we go further along, I'm going to want you to be starting to take um, practice tests from these various sites. Uh, but for right now, the first site is the one you want to do to review test questions uh, from the, the various chapters. Um, I'm so proud of you uh, for uh, how far we've gotten. Uh, before we close tonight, are there any questions from anyone? Yes, I have a question. You go right ahead. It's probably a high percentage, but what is the, the percentage of the students that take your class that pass the exam? About 90%. Very my, good. My friend Dave Ivey. That's has, encouraging. Has done that. Yeah. <laughs> so you <laughs> will you. do it. You'll get there. Your motivation is the key. If you want to get your license, we're, getting, we're giving you all the tools necessary for you to get there. And then once you get your license, we say it's a license to learn. You're not done. The learning is just starting. Any other questions tonight? All righty. Well, in 73, you have a very good week. We'll be in touch, and we'll see you next week, Wednesday night. Thanks, y'all. Will the link be on the web, on the handout, those uh, three links? I, I couldn't understand that. Will those link be on the handout? Yes, absolutely, yes. You'll get this in the handout. And uh, okay, if you're watching you. on YouTube, uh, there will be a link in the description box, uh, which will tell you where you can go to download all of the handouts for the class. All right, here we go. Jerry. Got... Jerry. It will be free to you. Jerry. Jerry. I was... Will my brain be able to survive this course? <laughs>